Hi, everyone. Welcome to the final event for our year long UCSD Ethnic Studies 30th anniversary celebration. Um, we're all so happy that you could be here today with us um, and so excited for this program. My name is Kristen Sasaki, and I'm an assistant professor in UCSD's Ethnic Studies Department and a member of the 30th Anniversary Colloquium Series Committee. This year, the goal of our committee was to create space for discussions that centered incarceration, abolition, settler colonialisms, transformative justice, and critical care as they connect to anti-Blackness and anti-Indigeneity and the work that Ethnic Studies as a project and formation does to speak back to these violences. We also wanted to make space for the wonderful work that Pacific Islander scholars and community activists are doing that engage with these questions and the project of ethnic studies with the hope of building more support for Pacific Islander studies students and community on our campus. Uh, before I pass it on to our moderator, Dr. Olivia Quintanita for our land acknowledgement and panelist introductions. Uh, on behalf of the anniversary committee, I wanted to do a couple of thank yous and make some very quick announcements for today's program. So uh, much appreciation goes out to the Ethics Studies Department and our co-sponsor for this event, the, the new Asian American and Pacific Islander Studies minor program and its director, Professor Simeon Mann. Uh, thank you to the student organization, Asians and Pacific Islanders for the Arts and Humanities and student member, Sophia Wynn for creating all of the fantastic artwork for our uh, promotional material. Thanks as well to Joseph Ronto Ramirez or Jojo and Spaces for sponsoring today's uh, quote unquote opportunity drawing. Uh, more on that in a bit. And uh, to Apometa and Wendy Sasaki for all of their support. We also wanted to say thank you to Cody Toscano and Keelan Thomas, our two ASL interpreters for your work today. Um, just a quick note on today's program. Um, again, thanks to Jojo and Spaces we will be having a small um, raffle or university lingo opportunity drawing. So for, um, for UCSD and Spaces alums, Dr. Miley Arvin's book, uh, Possessing Polynesians, right here, it's a really great book. Uh, so about halfway through the program, uh, we will open up, I think, a poll. And if you want to take part in the drawing, we will ask you to input your email information. And at a later point after today's program, we're going to randomly pick two emails uh, and contact you if you're a winner. Um, just a quick note about our chat function. For security purposes, we've had to shut down the general chat. Um, we might open it up for a few minutes so that people can enter the raffle or we're, we'll be using the, the poll function, I'm not sure, but we um, would welcome and would love any questions that you have for our presenters and are looking forward to our discussion. So please enter the questions that you have using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, so now let me introduce our moderator for today's discussion. Um, we are so very lucky to have Dr. Olivia Quintanitza here today. Uh, she earned her PhD from the from the Department of Ethnic Studies at UC San Diego in 2020. Uh, Dr. Quintanita's family is from Guahan and she used her academic opportunities as a Chamorro scholar to research the unique hi histories and futures of Pacific Island life. She is interested in climate justice, marine justice, Pacific underwater ecology and coral reef activism. Dr. Quintanita is a professor at San Diego Mesa Community College and will start as a UC President's postdoctoral fellow with the Department of Environmental Studies at UC Santa Barbara in the fall to continue her work on marine justice in Guam. So thank you again, and I'll hand it off uh, to Olivia for our land acknowledgement and our panelists' intros. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, good morning, half a day, and welcome. Thank you, Kristen, for that special introduction. Yourself and the organizing committee has put so much time and energy into making today possible. So on behalf of all of us, thank you so much. I want to start our session today with an acknowledgement that UC San Diego sits on the unceded Kumeyaay homelands. Today, the Kumeyaay, 
Kea Kowicham, Kowea, and Cupano peoples of the San Diego region continue to assert their political and cultural sovereignty in the face of unabating colonization and erasure. We honor their presence and struggles while also acknowledging indigenous peoples displaced from other homelands who now reside here. UC San Diego's Department of Ethnic Studies pledges to continue working on decolonizing our university in tangible ways that include and serve these and other First Nations peoples. I'd like to ask folks to take a moment of silence to honor a moment of silence and respect and reflection of our indigenous brothers and sisters. Thank you. I'm incredibly honored to be here with you all today to moderate our panel with a truly amazing group of scholars and activists. I can't believe we got so lucky to have all of you here in the same virtual space. Thank you so much for showing up for us today. And I'm thrilled that there's such a beautiful turnout. I see a lot of familiar faces in our Zoom room, and I've seen a lot of really positive buzz online and on social media about today's event. So I want to reflect and appreciate that community support and that energy as a reflection of all our panelists and how much you all are loved and respected by so many. So in terms of today's format, we'll have each guest speaker talk for about 10 minutes about the intersections of race and indigeneity in their work. And we'll save time at the end, like Kristen said, for about 30 minutes of Q&A from the audience. And now I will introduce our stellar panelists. And we will have folks present in this order as well. First up, we have Miley Arvin. Dr. Arvin is an assistant professor of history and gender studies at the University of Utah. She is a Native Hawaiian feminist scholar who works on issues of race, gender, science, and colonialism in Hawaii and the broader Pacific. At the University of Utah, she is co-director of Pacific Island Studies. Her recent book, Possessing Polynesians, The Science of Settler Colonial Whiteness in Hawaii and Oceania, was published by Duke University Press in 2019. Next, we have Michael Bavakwa. Dr. Bavakwa taught Guam history and Chamorro language at the University of Guam for 10 years. He runs a weekly podcast called Finatsu and currently works as a curator for the Guam Museum. With his brother, Jack, they run a creative collection called the Guam Bus that publishes Chamorro language books, comics, and learning materials. He is a co-chair for the Political Status Educational Outreach Group, Independent Guahan, and a member of Guam's Commission on Decolonization. We also have Fui Fui Lupe Nimatolu. Dr. Nimatolu is a Tongan scholar, storyteller, and community organizer. She is a 2021 UC President's Postdoctoral Fellow at the Department of Native American Studies at the University of California, Davis. Fui is a historian for the Segoria Te Land Trust, an urban indigenous women-led organization that works to rematriate indigenous lands back to indigenous hands, located in Oakland, California. Fui is part of the California Pacific Islander Coalition, advocating and expanding the scope of Pacific Island studies in the California Ethnic Studies curriculum. And last but not least, we have Joyce Pulani Warren. Dr. Warren is an assistant professor in the Department of English at the University of Hawaii Manoa, where she teaches courses on Native Hawaiian, Pacific, and Ethnic American literatures. Her research in interests include Po, Mana Wahini, 
indigeneity, blackness, and diaspora. The Huntington has just awarded her a 2021 to 2022 Barbara Thumb Postdoctoral Fellowship. Congratulations. She is a past recipient of the University of Oregon's Postdoctoral Research Fellowship in Ethnic American Literatures and Cultural Productions and the Ford Foundation's Dissertation Fellowship. How lucky are we? And now with that, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our first speaker, Dr. Miley Arvin. Dr. Arvin, take it away. Oh, thanks so much, Olivia. And um, really thank you to Kristen and Shaista, um, Yen, and all the other, Jose, all the other UCSD Ethnic Studies folks who have made this event possible. It's such a pleasure to be able to speak with Maguette and Fui, Pula, and Olivia today, all scholars who, um, whose work I respect and learn so much from. Um, uh, for those who might only be listening instead of viewing the screen, um, I'm a light-skinned Native Hawaiian woman with dark hair in my 30s. I have on glasses and a, a blue blazer, um, and my Zoom background image shows an aerial photo of the Salt Lake Valley with some of the buildings of the University of Utah campus visible in the foreground and the Wasatch Mountains in the background. Um, and we also have this border of a red Pacifica pattern block U logo that represents our Pacific Island Studies program here. Uh, this image of the beautiful land here reminds me to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from Utah, which is land named for the Ute tribe, and that the Salt Lake Valley is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshu, and Ute tribes. And it's my intention that my words here today remain in good relation with the Ute, Shoshone, Paiute, and Goshu peoples. Uh, so with my time today, um, I'll, I'll share a little bit about it, how I approach race and indigeneity in my book, uh, Possessing Polynesians, which uh, indeed began as my doctoral dissertation in the Ethnic Studies Department at UCSD. Um, I'll start, but by saying a little bit about how the book came to be and then briefly highlight the two main theories the book is structured around, namely the logic of possession through whiteness and regenerative refusals. So there are really many different genealogies of how I came to write this book. Um, and I wanna start by sharing a bit about the book's personal and academic origins. Uh, my mom grew up in Waimanalo, which is a small, largely native Hawaiian town on the windward side of Oahu. Um, on a Hawaiian homestead leased to her father by the territory of Hawaii in the early 1950s. Um, my tutu, or grandmother's house, uh, by the time I came to know it as a child, was always full of cousins, aunties, and uncles, both biologically related and not. And as beloved as that house was, as I got older, I also noticed that many people in my family struggled to have permanent secure housing in Hawaii. Um, and my tutu's modest house was not large enough to accommodate them all. I also came to understand that it was unlikely that most of the other people in my family would ever receive their own Hawaiian homestead because of the notorious long, notoriously long waiting list um, on which people still regularly die before ever <laughs> receiving a homestead and the blood quantum requirement. So that requirement enshrined in law by the 1920 Hawaiian Homes Commission Act and still enforced with few amendments today, states that a person must have no less than one half part Hawaiian blood in order to be eligible to lease a Hawaiian homestead. So this 50% requirement needs to be proven through uh, historical documentation, such as uh, notations of a person's race on their birth certificate, um, which can often be elusive or flawed. Um, and so in 2008, um, Kehalani Kawanui published a book, Hawaiian Blood, which was about the legal history of the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act. And while that book illuminates so much about the legal and political construction of the blood quantum rule and its legacies for Native Hawaiians, I found myself desiring a deeper understanding of the idea of blood quantum itself and the history of the racialization of Native Hawaiians. Um, 
let's see. Yeah. And so in graduate school, also one of my advisors was Denise Fiera de Silva, um, who is now at UBC, um, but used to be at UCSD. Um, and her mentorship and challenging texts toward a global idea of race pushed me to seek out genealogies of race in Hawaii in the history of social scientific knowledge production about Hawaii and the broader Pacific. Uh, such work was needed, I felt, in part because there's a popular and enduring myth that Hawaii has no racism, that it is a multicultural and multiracial melting pot where diverse ethnicities are universally celebrated. And though Hawaii is certainly more racially diverse than many parts of the continental United States, white supremacy and settler colonialism have, been, have embedded racial hierarchy and violence within the islands for a very long time. As I began to do the research for this project, I found that this myth of racial harmony in Hawaii was tied in significant ways to an older racial fiction, namely the idea that Polynesians are almost white. At first, I could not explain white settlers designated Polynesians as somewhat white, um, but I saw it recurring so often across social scientific writings from the 19th and early 20th centuries that I was forced to confront it. And ultimately both myths, that of Hawaii's racial harmony and of Polynesians' supposed proximity to whiteness I came to see are not just products of benign ignorance, but the intentional outcomes of settler colonial science that sought to naturalize white supremacy and indigenous dispossession in the Pacific Islands. In other words, social scientific questions about race in the Pacific Islands have never been innocent or apolitical, but are deeply implicated in creating and shaping racial categories that allow the structure of settler colonialism to operate. So the central argument of my book is that settler colonialism in Hawaii and Polynesia more broadly is fueled by a logic of possession through whiteness. In the logic of possession through whiteness, both Polynesia the place and Polynesians the people become exotic feminized possessions of whiteness, possessions that never had the power to claim the property of whiteness for themselves. Instead, the Polynesian race is repeatedly positioned as almost white, even literally as descendants of the Aryan race in some accounts, uh, in such a way that allows white settlers to claim indigeneity in Polynesia since according to this logic, whiteness itself is indigenous to Polynesia. This logic naturalizes white settler presence in Polynesia and allows white settlers to claim in various ways, rightful and natural ownership of various parts of Polynesia. And really notably this idea of whiteness making itself indigenous in order to control and own a place Violently, violently attempts to replace the quite different definition of indigeneity held by many Polynesians and other indigenous peoples, which emphasize relationships and responsibilities to land as an ancestor. Um, and so while whiteness is commonly the named referent, anti-blackness is also always a significant part of the Western construction of the Polynesian race as almost white. Like indigeneity, blackness is so often simultaneously invisible and hypervisible. Ideas about Polynesians being almost white were formed in distinction to ideas about Melanesians being black. And so uh, Melanesia, is, which is a distinct oceanic region uh, west of Polynesia and south of Micronesia, includes the present day countries of Papua New Guinea, West Papua, West Papua, the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, uh, New Caledonia or Kanaki and Fiji. And imperial and settler images of Melanesians projected fears about savage dark skinned cannibals and were used to justify practices of kidnapping and forced labor. Blackness as understood in the continental US in reference to African Americans also at times played a significant role in racial discourses in Oceania, especially in Hawaii. Um, and so really I argue that the more overtly racial, racist images of native Hawaiians were enabled by discourses about Polynesians proximity to whiteness rather than being a break from them. For whiteness in relation to Polynesians always remained a question and a problem despite accumulating social scientific knowledge over decades, declaring various definitive answers. The question, what is a Polynesian, asked over and over again by white social scientists in the 19th and early 20th centuries, was always implicitly or explicitly a question about whether Polynesians were white or black. 
white settlers wanted Polynesians to be whiter because it suited their own claims of belonging to Polynesia. Um, and so in part two of Possessing Polynesians, I analyze how Polynesians respond to critique and co-op this logic of possession through whiteness in the contemporary realms of law, science, and art through what I term regenerative refusals. Regenerative refusals are actions that seek to restore balance and life to indigenous communities that continue to live with structures of settler colonialism. Regenerative refusals in my usage are not about a return to exactly what things were like before. They're an ongoing reckoning with settler colonialism rather than a denial of it. Um, and maybe if I still have a little bit of time, I can share um, my screen and I'll just, I wanted to talk a little bit about, sorry, let's see, can people see that? Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the image that's actually on my book cover, um, which is by the artist uh, Yuki Kihara. Um, and in, in part of my book, I look at how contemporary indigenous Pacific artists like Kihara um, engage with the ongoing uh, violence of the colonial gaze on indigenous bodies. Kihara's work, I argue, embodies refusal in the sense that it subverts viewers' expectations of receiving authentic information about indigenous cultures or indigenous feelings, as well as viewers' understandings that colonialism is a thing of the past. Um, and so this image is from Kihara's series called A Study of a Samoan Savage um, from uh, 2015. And it includes a number of photographs, most of which feature a Samoan man being subjected to anthropometric tools held by a white hand that often is just jutting out um, from the edge of the, um, the photograph. Um, and the subject of Kihara's study is an embodiment of Maui, the Polynesian uh, demigod who slowed the sun and fished up the islands. Maui is photographed apparently nude in the style of an anthropometric photograph. But unlike um, in the work of uh, physical anthropologists that this work references, in Kihara's images, the subject seems to glow in war warm tones of brown skin that shine against a black backdrop. Uh, this warmth contributes to the portrayal of Maui as both human and otherworldly and contrasts with a disembodied white hand. Um, Played by the Samoan artist Ione, his expressions appear defiant and annoyed at the probing metal tools measuring his nose and skull. Um, the tools appear, appear sharp and potentially painful, though Maui's blank resistant expressions betray no signs of being harmed. His countenance reminds viewers that he is a trickster and a shapeshifter who could likely escape not only the anthropologist calipers, but this bodily human form for another life form. Maui is an akua, or a god or ancestor um, that many Polynesian peoples, as well as some Micronesian and Melanesian peoples share across their histories. By choosing Maui as the imagined subject of settler colonial science then, Kihara provides a broad swath of Pacific Islanders a connection to the series and deliberately flaunts the designation of Samoan savage that an anthropologist might use to label Maui. So the joke here is on the scientist who does not realize Maui's mana or power and by extension the mana of all indigenous Pacific Islanders. Overall, regenerative refusals recognize violence and pain, but not to make that the center of indigenous identity. Rather, these refusals highlight the importance of envisioning and enacting different futures that are suffused with more love, humor, connection, and freedom. For refusals can also be passed to connection in the sense, in the context of settler colonial dispossession. Sometimes refusals and boundaries are the best and clearest way, a path to staying in good relation with people, with places, with knowledge. In Hawaii, kapu, um, which is often translated into English as taboo or prohibition, recognizes precisely this, that there are limits passed down from ancestors that are honored and practiced because it protects not only a sacred place or person, from harm, but because it protects ourselves too. Whatever our ongoing strategies against the logic of possession through whiteness may be, we must anticipate being unsettled. But we also must rejoice in the fact that such unsettling is part of the collective work we must do, 
caringly and carefully to recognize, to realize our interconnected, expansive oceanic future. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Urban. That was wonderful. I'd like to invite Dr. Babakwa to share with us next. I'm happy to be here uh, with all of you amongst familiar faces, uh, former professors, uh, former thesis writing partners, dissertation writing partners. Um, some of the people in the Zoom room, I remember staying at coffee shops until they closed, uh, working on things. And so hanging out in the hallway in the ethnic studies program. And so it's, it's nice after a year of being locked down to, to have a virtual meeting like this. I look forward to seeing people in person uh, someday, especially to Yen. I'm so glad to see Yen uh, over Zoom and I look forward to the next time that I get to, to see you. Uh, Yen was my dissertation chair. And so <laughs> it's been, a, it's nice to reconnect with her. And so, um, for me, in terms of this conversation, and I am very thankful to be included in this, um, a lot of this comes down to sort of Guam and its position in the world today. Guam in history is one of the first places in the Pacific to be colonized. Most recently, we, we commemorated 500 years since Magellan stumbled upon Guam. And so, but Guam is also one of the last places in the Pacific to be decolonized or to have achieved an independent state or a freely associated state. And so because of this, my, when I entered into sort of life as a scholar, or as a community activist, you know, questions of decolonization were always on my mind. And as I interacted with uh, the Chamorro community on Guam, um, as I talked to the Chamorro community in San Diego, 20 years ago, the conversation was always that decolonization is suicide. Decolonization is, is impossible. Many people, and I remember writing in my master's thesis that decolonization, people said that we can't decolonize because I like McDonald's and I don't want to give up McDonald's. People would say we can't decolonize because I like my air conditioning. I don't want to give up my air conditioning. And on the other side of it, sometimes Chamorros would say, we can't decolonize because if we did, China would invade us and we would only be able to fight them off with spears and stones. And so the more that I sort of got into that, those types of discussions and those ideas, you know, the more that what I was reading as a grad student about sort of the impact of colonization on indigenous people, the sort of the ways in which indigenous people are sort of dragged or forced into sort of modern epistemologies. Um, you know, I began to realize that the Chamorros, even if they haven't taken a class with uh, on ethnic studies or on social theory, they nonetheless bear the scars and the marks of a lot of those um, and on a lot of that history, uh, these certain ideas. And so as I start, and so I wanted to kind of uh, figure out a way to think about decolonization in a way which no longer disempowered Chamorro people, but could empower uh, us instead. <clears throat> and so in, in one of my master's thesis, for example, I said, uh, as people said, uh, the decolonization is suicide, my response was that, sure, of course, absolutely, decolonization is suicide. And then I used uh, Franz Fanon's theories to argue that what he talks about there is the, is the suicide of the colonized person a colonized subject which allows sort of a, a rebirth in a decolonial context to take place. And so as sort of the years have gone on and as I've sort of worked, I worked at the University of Guam as a scholar for a decade, as I've worked in the community as an activist around these things, sort of this issue of decolonization became very, very real because Guam, as me and I see many Chamorros see many people with Guam ties as attendees. And I'm glad that so many of you could make, uh, make it. Some of you are my relatives. Some of you are my uh, students. You're my language students. And so as I am, um, Guam is a territory of the United States. It is a colony of the United States. 
It is one of a handful of territories that the United States still holds. It's one of a handful of the territories that the United Nations still recognizes as being in need of decolonization. Guam is also one of the most strategically uh, militarily important assets that the United States has. And so on Guam, we know this because sacred sites, sites where traditional medicine is found, sites where small families have been evicted and pushed off their land after World War II, the United States military is currently militarizing those areas, destroying uh, human remains, destroying artifacts, um, and threatening to cut off fishermen from traditional fishing grounds. And so this issue of decolonization then becomes something in which can, amongst all of these different frameworks of power, which happen sort of at the very personal level to the larger sort of macro level that disempower a Chamorro in Guam today and in today's world, what can we do about them? How can we frame decolonization in a way to sort of, to reverse sort of uh, these positions? And so, in terms of coming up with um, a very practical way of decolonization, one which I could use on a daily basis, whether I'm talking to sort of an, an older Chamorro woman or a young Chamorro person, or even somebody who is a settler on Guam, a non-Chamorro, trying to talk to them about this issue of decolonization. And sort of one very pragmatic approach that I took to decolonization is um, it's not a time traveling journey no, not at all, but it is a very sort of reflective conversation about colonial legacies. So that, um, and sort of what to do with them and what to do next. In the way in which the indigenous per person enters the modern world sort of as something which is stigmatized and marked as being of the past, unable to seize the future, unable to embody sort of the future, <clears throat> sort of reframing decolonization as something which is, is not necessarily, which no longer sort of connects you, links you, or excuse me, no longer sort of fixes you in the past as something sort of which can open up the future, but sort of provide that means of self-determination, allow the sort of the colonized person a means in which they can reassert themselves and also open up things which they long thought could not be touched. And so, for example, for Chamorros, the issue of cultural dance is something which has been very complicated. The Spanish came into the island, and by the 1700s, most traditional dances had been forgotten or prohibited by the Spanish, along with traditional navigation and many other things. In the 1970s, as Chamorros went to the Festival of the Pacific of the Arts, and interacted with other indigenous people across the Pacific and seeing how their cultures had not been sort of as affected by colonization, Chamorros began to wonder because it had, be, it had come to this point where Chamorros only felt like the dances they had were the jitterbug, the cha-cha, and that there wasn't any possibility for them to dance beyond those sorts of things. And so Chamorros began to sort of using influences and sometimes sometimes borrowing sort of influences from other Pacific Island peoples, they tried to sort of revive a tradition of dancing. And as it, when I teach about that today, I always say that, you know, a lot of times indigenous people feel that the weight of history presses down on you. You feel that you have debts to those who, who colonized you, debts to those who quote unquote discovered you but it also makes you feel like you don't have any choices because the weight of that history sort of only makes it feel like you can move in one direction. And so in terms of dance, I always say, you know, the weight of that history told Chamorros that you lost your dances and you can never dance again. It's not possible for you to, because it can't ever be what you originally danced with. And so then working on, so, but then seeing sort of how Chamorro dance went from being sort of just the cha-cha and the jitterbug and the electric slide. I look forward to the pandemic being over so we can electric slide again. And so to then sort of 
seeing these new traditions evolve, which are inspired by the accounts of ancient dance, which sort of draw influences from neighboring islands across the Pacific, and how then those have become almost hegemonic and dominant today, to the point where when the first generation of sort of new Chamorro dances were put out in the 80s, many members of the community sort of um, didn't like them, said that they were fake, not real. Um, and in fact, some of those, that first generation of dancers said that their own relatives would throw cans at them at, at parties and fiestas while they were performing, basically telling them that they weren't real or telling them that that's not how Chamorros dance. But I always like to point out to people that, that those people who threw cans at their relatives who were dancing in quote unquote ancient style, many of those same people now have their grandchildren in those same dance groups today. And from those dance, and many of those young people in those dance groups now join with community activists to chant outside of military bases um, over the taking of Chamorro lands, over the treatment of historic artifacts and human remains. And so for me, decolonization, it can be sort of this very abstract concept. It can be about changing Guam's political status <laughs> but to me, it is also about trying to open up those things that Chamorros felt from their colonial past that they could not touch, could not touch. And 500 years since Magellan visited Guam, it's been exciting to see the impact of Chamorros opening up that history and finding a new and different way of interpreting that and therefore seeing their future in a very different way as well. In the 20th century, the first public monument that Chamorros created for anybody was for Magellan. In 1926, they, uh, some Chamorros with some, so the Guam was under the US Navy control at that time, created a monument and a version of it still stands in the Southern part of Guam documenting Magellan's arrival. And there was a, a regular holiday called Discovery Day in which Chamorros commemorated Magellan's visit to Guam. <laughs> but it's been very heartening to see how that has been challenged over time. The Discovery Day holiday has been done away with and it's been replaced with Guam history and Chamorro Heritage Day. And that for many years, a reenactment of Magellan's arrival was done in the Southern village of Yamadak um, in which, and it would sometimes be kind of funny because Magellan would be played by whoever they could find who was white and usually had a beard. And they would bring Magellan in on, a, on like a motorboat into the bay. And then there would be some huts down there and Magellan would come and some Chamorros, usually young people would give him fruits and stuff. And then Magellan would set their huts on fire and get on his boat and leave. But, What's happened in recent years is that those cultural dance groups that I've mentioned have taken over the performances of the reenactment. And so what happens now is that before Magellan arrives, there's sometimes an hour of talk about the history of the Chamorro people and their origins and their life prior to colonization. And then when Magellan arrives, Chamorros give him food, he sets huts on fire, but oftentimes what the young people decide to do is they decide to not let Magellan win. And so sometimes in these reenactments, Magellan gets killed. You get some young Chamorro dudes and some young Chamorro women who wanna show off their MMA moves to Magellan when he arrives on the island. And so this is one way in which I like to talk about decolonization. It doesn't belong only to sort of scholars. It doesn't belong to only activists. It is something that we, can all sort of realize in our lives. But part of it comes and it starts with these critical conversations about what are these colonial legacies? And we have the ability to sift through them and we have the ability to decide what stays and what goes. And so Sidus Masi again, for allowing me to participate in this panel. Thank you so much, Dr. Babakwa. I learned so much from you always. And now I'd like to invite Dr. Nima Tolu to share her work with us. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Olivia, I'm just wondering, is it possible that I could um, uh, share a screen? Yeah. 
Yes, I think our organizers can give you access. There you go. No key. All right. Wow. Thank you so much, relatives. I'm taking a deep breath because for those of you who, who, who know, uh, earlier I had a, a few problems um, with my uh, computer. So really it is, it's a great honor to be here. Um, if that's okay, relatives, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read. I, I, I you know, I, I wrote a few things because really I could talk story till tomorrow, you know, I'm Tongan. So we could talk story, but I really wanted to uh, be very um, respectful of my time. So firstly, I just wanted to say congratulations. And I wanted to show my gratitude to uh, Professor Christian Sasaki and to my sister, uh, beloved uh, professor as well, Shaista Patel, and your wonderful team at UC San Diego. Um, I really wanted to thank you for doing the difficult and decolonial work of recognizing the sovereignty of Pacific Islander scholars and the respective Pacific Islander families and communities that we represent. And I want to sincerely thank you for resisting and refusing to classify us or to tokenize us under the rubric of AAPI, a colonial classification designated by US militarization and US empire. Thank you for doing this important decolonial work of seeing us. Also next to that, I wanted to give a big shout out and I wanted to say congratulations uh, to the Department of uh, Ethnic Studies at UC San Diego on your 30th birthday. So the next thing I also wanted to honor and acknowledge the three panelists and uh, you know, family, definitely uh, our Moana Nui family, our three panelists and also our wonderful moderator and facilitator. I, I know most of you, I know the three panelists and Olivia, I can't wait to get to know you and congratulations too on your UC postdoc. So um, I have so much love and respect, so much love and respect uh, for all of you scholars. I wanted to humbly take a moment to honor you beloved scholars and your ancestors from our Moana Nui, our Oceania. This town or space or space of conversation should be acknowledged because we peoples of Oceania are severely erased in this nation and especially within academic institutions. So we also honor our, ac our academic ancestors um, from Oceania and the Pacific Islands that have been fighting for us and whose work opened the door, whose work, whose decolonial work, whose sacrifices, whose great love for us, whose great love for us, because the term Oceania is actually a term that was created by uh, one of our beloved ancestors, the father of Pacific Island Studies at Beli Ha'opa. It's actually a term of great love. It's his great love for us. And it's a term of our resilience. And it's a term of all the possibilities for decolonization. So we also thank those ancestors. To those ancestors too, we say, Watu. Thank you for your great work, ancestors, because it's because of you that we're here today. And when I say ancestors too, I also mean ancestors of this present moment. And that includes you, of course, our brother, beloved brother Migetu, also Miley, Miley, who was on my dissertation committee and who was there pushing me towards the end. All, all, all 13 of those years, Malia was there pushing me towards the end. And also Sister Pua, I wanna say thank you so much too for your great work and reminding us too of how Black Lives has always mattered, has always mattered for those of us from one and all. So I just wanna, please forgive me, as I guess today is a day of uh, computers uh, not working for me. But, but it is, it's just slowly, it's taking its, it's, it's a Tongan computer, I guess. Uh, it's just taking its time, everybody. Oh, okay, there we go, there we go. Next, I, I wanted to uh, 
Next, I wanted to honor and acknowledge the Lishana Ohlone tribe, the first and last stewards of the land of the body of land called Hu Chen, the land that is now known as the East Bay, California, that includes the cities of Berkeley and Oakland. These are the bodies of land that my family and I currently live in and call our new home. The land acknowledgments for Tongan and Pacific peoples is a ceremony of great importance because it is a speciality for honoring genealogies of relationalities or materializing the methodology that we Tongans call Dauhi Va. Dauhi means caring or nourishing and Va is described by the Samoan poet and scholar, Albert Wend as quote, the space between. The betweenness, not empty space, not space that separates, but space that relates, end of quote. Correspondingly, the Tongan scholar and poet Gunai Helutheman defined Dauhiva as, quote, important relationships of nurturing interpersonal relations. And it is inclusive of multiple spatialities that include simultaneously the physical, cultural, and the spiritual, end of quote. Thus, the Tongan methodology Dauhiva delineates the centrality of cultivating and stewarding relationalities that not only connect us to each other as human beings, and for those of us, connects us uh, from nation to nation, island to island in Oceania, but it circles and it is rooted in our ancestors, the natural world, and on the land, our mother earth, our fanua, a term that also describes our umbilical cords. And this circle extends and it embraces our ocean or our moana. These are cosmologies that Tongans and people of Oceania define as the sacred. These are cosmologies that Tongans and people of Oceania uh, define also as the feminine. Thus the Tongan methodology of Dahiva unequivocally delineates and reminds us that as Tongans, our fatonia or our ancestral responsibilities and obligations is to protect the sacred. As a Tongan settler and using Jody Bird's term arrivance on unceded Lishana Ohlone land, the land acknowledgement asks us to embody what respected Lishana Ohlone leader Karina Gold asks of all of us, non Ohlone living on her ancestral territory. She asks us to become quote, good guests so that we, the Ohlone, can be good hosts. Well, how generous is that? How generous is that? This means that the land acknowledgement demands that we Tongans Dauhiva and follow our ancestral calling by standing as relatives and as accomplices with the indigenous peoples and stewards of the land in their struggles to rematriate their lands and waters and in their unrelenting struggles to protect their sacred sites from desecration. So relatives, I just wanted to share briefly some of the, some of the, the key themes and perhaps some of the objectives of what I wanted to present. Um, the Pacific nation Tonga currently holds the global record of the highest conversion rate into the US-based Mormon church in the 20th and 21st centuries. In this presentation, I briefly examined the spatiality of what I call the Tongan Mormon family a site that is manufactured and maintained by, a phenom by the phenomenon of white terror, deployed by US empire and the histories of U US military occupation of Tonga during World War II. White terror is a racialized violence aimed to produce colonial uh, systems of family, gender and sexualities against the bodies of Tongan women and girls. And correspondingly, the scope of white terror is inextricably tied to the expropriation of the Tongan natural world, the Fonua, land, or our mother earth, and to the Moana, or our mother, the ocean. Spatialities that Tongan cosmologies have, uh, that are delineated, excuse me, as feminine and located at the core of what we define as a sacred. The sacred is the core of Tongan systems and economies of relationalities. And it is the heart and the lifeline of Tonganists. White terror, excuse me. Okay, let's see. Oh, okay. So 
everybody. I was supposed to have put that on, okay? So we just move really quickly to this one. So white terror, in this section, I, I use Franz Fernand's uh, important work to examine white terror, a violence that is exhaustive, insatiable and unrelenting in its intentions and grasp. It reaches into the core of indigenous systems of relationalities and cosmologies known to us Tongans as Ba, to deliberately obfuscate and obliterate the balance of connections between lifelines that lead directly and are rooted in the natural world as, as, as I talked about again before, uh, the feminine or the sacred. For Tongans, the sacred is a heartbeat of Tonganess, meaning that it is a site of copious mana, copious mana, a fertile and productive site of strength, power and knowledge for sustaining, producing and dreaming Tonganess. Thus the colonial projects institution, institute, institution institutionalization of heteropatriarchy at the heart of Tongan systems of Ba was intentional. For as Franz Fanon argues, this strategy aimed for the total colonization of Tonganess. So I turn to Franz Fanon's seminal work, A Wretched of the Earth, where he profoundly deconstructs the white colonizers' insatiable desire for power by identifying the psychological root of his desires as a European ontology and methodology that Fanon terms as perverted logic. Fanon contends that the perverted logic of the European colonizer that undergirds the colonial project is unrelenting and insatiable in its desires to subjugate the native. Quote, perhaps we have not sufficiently demonstrated that colonialism is not simply content to impose its rule upon the present and the future, end of quote, because this is not enough. And to further demonstrate the insatiable appetite of European colonizers, he states, quote, colonialism is not satisfied with merely holding a people in its grip and emptying the native's brain of all form and contact, end of quote, because according According to his analysis, the colonizers deployed a strategy that is methodical and strategic, and it, quote, turns to the past of the oppressed people, and it distorts, disfigures, and destroys it, end of quote. The Tongan past of the colonial project heinously, quote, distorts, disfigures, and destroys, end of quote, end of quote, are the systems and economies of Tongan Ba that are rooted in the feminine, the natural world, the sacred. The colonial project's objective for quote, total domination and subjugation of the native strategically aimed to redefine the native's past by maligning it, devaluing quote, devaluing pre-colonial history, a colonial technology that respected scholar and one of our beloved ancestors of Oceania and Pacific Island studies at Bellyhow Ofa argues what is, was a practice that transpired in Tonga and the Pacific region. And this violence produced the severing of time and space into two dichotomous spatialities. Quote, the era of darkness associated with savagery and barbarianism and the era of light and civilization ushered in by Christianity, end of quote. Franz Fanon's theorizing is in conversation with how Ofa. He states, quote, devaluing of pre-colonial history, quote, end of quote, that included the systemic denigration and the criminalization of the quote, quote, customs of the colonized people, their traditions, their myths, are the very sign of that poverty of spirit and their constitutional depravity, end of quote. So everybody, I'm just gonna go down really quickly here. In my book projects, I'm in conversation with Renan on his theory of perverted logic, and uh, especially in, in my work in Tonga and in the Pacific. And in our, our theorizing conversation that we have, I center gender, sexualities, and Tongan and Oceanian feminisms as methodological lenses and histories that can help to expand and enrich the discussions. Furthermore, in our conversation, this is between me and uh, Fanon, by the way, I use the historical maneuvers of white terror in Donga to show that the objectives and perverted logic of this violence was not just racialized, but it was in fact inherently and unequivocally gendered. 
In addition, I argue that the aim of white terror was not just to subjugate Tonganists in the past and in the present moment, but, but its desires are exhaustive and its reach extended to the surveillance of Tongan futurities and continue the objectives and themes of Tongan subjugation constituted through the normalization of violence against the bodies of Tongan women and girls and concomitantly the deployment of violence against the bodies of land for Nua and our mother, and our mother, the ocean, our Moana. In my book projects, I trace the historical maneuvers of white terror to the 17th century and the arrival of the first Europeans, Dutch explorers exploring, uh, searching for capitalistic acquisition and gain. And the chronology continues to the arrival of the London Missionary Society and their prodigious uh, missionizing project extending to the voyages of the renowned British captain, James Cook and his historical naming of Tonga as the Friendly Islands in the 18th century. But with respect to time and in this presentation, I concentrate on the contemporary spatiality. Please everybody forgive me. I live in East Oakland. So what you're hearing right now is the train. So, okay, the train just left, okay. So returning back to, to white terror, the chronology of white terror in Tonga, um, with respect to time, as I, as I mentioned, I concentrate on the contemporary spatiality that I term the Tongan Mormon family, a spatiality that is produced, maintained, and continues to proliferate the maneuvers of white terror on the body of Tonganess. Okay. I begin, I begin my discussion of the Tongan Mormon family by showing uh, two images. Okay, let's show those two images. There we go. Um, it's showing two images from the LA Times taken in 2008 in front of the, of the Mormon temple in Oakland, California, during the Prop 8, uh, Prop 8 cultural wars, so to speak. Right, and um, the photos show Tongan men participating in what they term as protecting the sacred on behalf of the Mormon church. Before I examine the photos, I want to give some information to, to you know, just to, to our, our Delanoa space, to, to folks who are in our conversation about what Proposition 8 was. So Proposition 8 was a California ballot proposition and a state constitutional amendment intended to ban same-sex marriage and to institutionalize the boundaries that marriage is an institution that should only be with a man and a woman. Prop 8 passed in the November two, uh, 2008 California state elections and was later overturned in court. The proposition was produced and financially supported by opponents of women's rights and LGBT rights, such as the Mormon church, one of the world's most wealthiest and most powerful religious institutions. The US-based Mormon church and other neoliberal institutions exponentially rose to prominence and to power after the US military occupation of Tonga during World War II. Returning to my analysis of the photo, uh, photographic images, the mainstream's image, I, I, I wrote this in, a, in another uh, project, and this was some of my reactions to these images, especially the ways that they were um, propagated and they were consumed uh, here in the US. The mainstream media's imagery of Tonganess was enticing. The big brown bodies of our Tongan men were militarized and used as weapons to police Mormon temples from Oakland, San Diego, Fresno, reaching all the way to LA. Tongan male bodies were deployed as borders to draw lines of separation from the crowds of gay rights activists and ordinary community members that refused hate. The images of Tongan were depicted matter of factly as if they were true, as if Tongan is what the Mormon church had created of us, a spatiality devoid of gay, queer, and feminine, and the feminine, a speciality then that is devoid of mana. The mainstream media fed us endless images, but one in particular still haunts me. The image portrayed in the LA Times depicts 
volatile tongue and male rage vying on a national stage against a small and Jewish lesbian woman. This image still breaks my heart. And as I read it, uh, yeah, I, I get really emotional because it's, it still breaks my heart, even to today, many, many years later. What was not shown in these images were the bodies of Tongan and women. Tongan and women that held the knowledge that recognized that the bodies of Leiti are queer and women and women are the true warriors doing the work of Dawi Fonua and Dawi Va or protecting the sacred. And that we are at the front lines of our Tongan communities. What was not shown was the many diverse and beautiful bodies of Tongan queer, queer and Leiti and the multitude of Tongan men, the multitude of Tongan men that have historically refused the colonial institution of heteropatriarchy. In addition, what was not shown in these images was the faces of privilege and unabated power. The images not shown, that were not shown, were the faces of the wealthy white male Mormon church leaders issuing the orders that specifically targeted Tongan and Pacific Islander communities, calling them out to use their big brown bodies to police the front lines, while they, to police the front lines, while they sat safely behind their US white male and class privileges in Salt Lake City, Utah. Relatives, I recognize that my time is up. Uh, I was going to show a little bit about uh, this particular image of my baptism into the Mormon church. And I, I will add with this, you know, this uh, was, this was a, a, a ceremony. This was a, a the presentation concludes a return to the Tongan, migra to Tongan migrations navigated by the U.S. Um, Mormon church to Hu the, un the occupied, un excuse me, the occupied and unceded. Uh, Lashana Ohlone land, also called as the East Bay, California. This this particular photograph is taken in at the oldest Ohlone, Lashana Ohlone uh, sacred site, which is the West Berkeley Shaman in 2019. This is a ceremony that we uh, that I'm so proud of because I worked. We created we created this with uh, many many young uh, Pacific Islander men and women uh, for different colleges here in the Bay Area. This, this particular ceremony was to honor Mauna Kea, um, the, the native Hawaiian uh, sacred site, right? That's currently under um, threat of desecration. And so in this particular image, I just wanna briefly show this. You see, of course, uh, the American Indian movement flag, right? Um, also you see, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this and some of the questions that we're uh, gonna be uh, talking about. You see also our solidarity, our great love for our Melanesian brothers and sisters who are fighting for their lives and who are fighting for their lands and their self-determination in West Papua. We also see there's a flag there of our relatives who are fighting. And, and I really wanna recognize that in all these movements for decolonization in the Pacific are women. Women are at the forefront and also uh, a two-spirit are at the forefront of these movements for self-determination. Uh, we also have, there, yep, uh, Kukia Imana, made by some wonderful, wonderful artists here in the Bay Area. We also, in, in the space here, the sacred space also of ceremony, I really want to recognize that Kia'i also included the, the front line, included elders, the front line included women, the front line included Mahu, two spirit gender non-binary. Also, we have a flag there that perhaps is not really seen. It's also from our Irish brothers and sisters. Right, we also have, uh, there are so many different, also the Tino Ranga Tiro Tanga flag of Maori self-determination. We're standing with the young people that included Tukuta Pui, please forgive me if I'm saying that wrong, Maori uh, queer as well. Uh, the, the leadership of the, the protection for the sacred site, Ihu Ma Tau, is uh, Panya Newton, a young Maori woman, as well as so many other young people. So relatives, I leave you with this. This is perhaps, you know, Miley, your, your important, important contribution and your term, uh, regenerative, ref regenerative refusal. And as you talked about, uh, Miguetu, this is our self-determination. 
This is us uh, 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 perhaps um, listening to our foremothers and our forefathers and our ancestors in their dreams of self-determination and decolonization that is, that is embodied within the discourse of Oceania. Our work is to protect the sacred. And this is, I, I hope that, yeah, I hope that this, this image shows how this work to protect the sacred is thriving is thriving and it's alive today. So to Alpha, to much love and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Nematolu. That was so powerful and much needed. I'd like to now invite our last speaker for today, Dr. Warren. Um, aloha mai kako. Uh, oh, Joyce Puolani Warren, ko inoa. Uh, mahalo nui loa e Professor Sasaki. Um, ame Dr. Kintanitsa. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Joyce Puolani Warren. Um, please feel free to call me Pua. If you can't tell, I'm really excited to be here and talk to like adults outside of my household. This is very exciting. Um, and I very much appreciate the invitation from Professor Sasaki and all the folks at UC San Diego's Ethnic Studies Department. Um, Congratulations on the last 30 years, and I look forward to all the amazing work to come in the next 30. Um, so I'd like to spend some time today thinking about how our contemporary understandings of Blackness in Oceania are a manifestation or accumulation of centuries of entanglements of both race and indigeneity. Um, so to do this, I'll begin with an overview of the many facets of Blackness in Oceania, um, epistemological, cosmogenic, ontological, and political, as well as the aforementioned uh, racial and indigenous. Um, so here, I am also perhaps posing the question, um, what do we mean when we say the Black Pacific? Uh, so in my attempt to answer, I offer a view of the um, Right now, roughly four categories into which Black Pacific scholarship tends to fall. Um, I'll then give a short discussion of where my work lies and the ways it perhaps works across multiple categories. Ah, okay. PowerPoint is doing weird things, guys, so I'm just going to name them for you. <laughs> okay, uh, so the first category is epistemological or cosmogenic blackness. Um, so this is where a lot of my work on poll uh, falls. Um, the second is indigenous black Pacific Islanders. Um, so thank you, Professor Arvin, for talking a little bit about this uh, region that folks call Oceania, or sorry, Melanesia. Um, but there I'm uh, thinking of folks whose blackness is indigenous to the Pacific. Right, so folks from uh, Papua, um, Kanaki, all of these places. Um, the third category that this work tends to fall into is African diasporic Black folks who are in the Pacific. Um, and then the fourth is mixed race Pacific Islanders who are also African diasporic. Um, so work tends to fall in those categories. Um, today I'll talk uh, about some of my work that falls into the first category and also kind of bleeds into others, um, which is my work on poll, uh, P-O with a kahako over the O, um, or if you speak English, a macron. Uh, so Oceania is vast and our knowledges are boundless. A uh, poll is understood differently across and sometimes even within island chains. Um, so out of necessity, I will limit my remarks to a small fragment of Kanaka Maoli or native Hawaiian iterations of poll. Um, so Kanaka Maoli uh, knowledges, epistemology and cosmogony dictate that all life and existence come from poll. Um, poll is the darkness, a chaotic yet generative space from which life emerges. Predicated on the absence of stasis, poll is a liminal space. It is also imagined as a vortex, spiral and expansive. In addition to its spatial characteristics, pole is temporally expansive, producing a view of time that is spiral rather than linear. Within pole, time and space are not necessarily discrete categories, which is evident in the linguistic collapsing of terms. For example, in languages such as Maori and Hawaiian, the same word uh, wa, uh, or va can be used for time or space. 
Um, wa is also the term used to mark formal divisions of the Kumulipo, which is the Kanaka Maoli creation chant, which details the unfolding of all life from the generative cosmogenic blackness of pole, um, which I'll discuss a little bit later. Um, so the natural world, the gods and humanity are all linked by their genealogical succession from pole. Thus, uh, pole affords one access to all points of time and space in discussions of cosmogony, genealogy, ontology, epistemology, all of the like big fancy buzzwords we like to use in academia. Um, so pole is a site of temporal and spatial expansiveness that accommodates, but does not necessarily attempt to order all of existence. Um, so, like I said, Oceania is vast. I'm speaking specifically about Kanaka Maoli or Native Hawaiian, um, but also um, branching out into what colonial cartographies would call Polynesia, right? Um, and I understand that the term is, is problematic, um, but Polynesian epistemology and cosmogony teach us that all life comes from pole, the generative boundness blackness that began the world, and to which Kanaka Maoli, Samoans, Maori, and many other indigenous Pacific peoples are genealogically connected. Yet, since uh, at least the 16th century, um, as Professor Bavakwa gave us a, a rundown uh, in his talk, um, European and American settler colonial empires have constructed blackness as an epistemological lack and an ontological corruption using it to rupture kinship ties across Oceania and justify the overthrow of sovereign nations. With an eye towards the disciplinary concerns of ethnic studies and its legacy rooted in activism, um, in this talk, I want to ask what is possible if we recenter indigenous Pacific constructions of blackness as relational? Mm -hmm. um, how might Pole reaffirm indigenous kinship across Oceania, what role might Pole play in sustaining connections between Black liberation and indigenous sovereignty within and beyond Oceania? What would an expanded understanding of indigenous Pacific epistemologies and experiences of Blackness contribute to local communities in California? Um, Listen, this is not a formal part of my talk, guys, but I grew up in Southern California. So I rep this PI diaspora very hard. It is the center of, of a lot of my research. Um, so um, with that in mind, the US West Coast has become a de facto part of Oceania for many of our diasporic communities um, who often find themselves living among, working beside, um, becoming friends and loving black folks, right? Um, so what, what does an indigenous understanding of blackness do um, for us folks in the diaspora as, as well as folks within Oceania? Um, like many Pacific languages, Olalo Hawaii is highly metaphoric and contextual. In addition, words often have multiple meanings which can be simultaneously invoked within a single usage. Um, so all of my work on pole understood variously as darkness or blackness um, draws on many of these. Um, so in all of my work, I simultaneously engage with Paul in its, um, <clears throat> sorry, in its many etymological, literal, and figurative forms. It can be cosmogenic source and realm of the gods, as in my kapol mai. It can be the literal darkness of night. It can order time, as in na o kamahina, the nights of the month. Right. I'd also like to point out that what we think of in English as a day, as that cycle of 24 hours, um, in the Hawaiian worldview, it begins at night. Right. So literally reorienting how we think of time. Um, in some cases, pole can be both helpful and harmful, as in the word popolo, the black nightshade plant, which can be eaten for its medicinal purposes, uh, but which has historically been used by some in a derogatory manner to refer to black people. Um, although, you know, footnote here, see the Popolo project and all the work they're doing. Um, so in some instances, the etymology can reveal to us how literal meanings became enmeshed with figurative ones through colonial influences, as in the word poele, uh, which can be literally black or dark. Uh, but it, it also became, as Mary Kavanapukui tells us in the Hawaiian Dictionary, quote, figuratively ignorant or benighted, end quote. Um, these are but a few examples of Pole's capaciousness, which I offer as examples of how Blackness has always already been a fecund multiplicity in Kanaka Maoli and broader indigenous Pacific thought. 
Um, in the late 19th century, Hawaiian monarchs King Kalakaua and his sister and successor Queen Liliuokalani turned to this multivalent understanding of pole when American imperialists used anti-Blackness to justify their efforts to overthrow the Hawaiian kingdom. Um, so American annexationists in Hawaii and in the United States used anti-Black rhetoric and imagery in an attempt to racialize and subsequently mark our ali'i, um, our uh, royalty as unfit to rule, and by extension, Hawaii as unfit to be a sovereign nation, and thus in need of American intervention. Hawaii annexationists often made these racialized and racist attacks in newspapers. In Hawaii, they began rumors that Kalakaua was the child of, I'm sorry guys, I laugh every time I say this, um, <laughs> but rumors that he is the, the child, the illegitimate child of a quote, mulatto shoemaker or perhaps a Negro blacksmith. Um, Sereno Bishop, a missionary descendant and avid annexationist and newspaper editor, um, frequently used, quote, frequently expressed in print mm -hmm. that any admixture of African would be disastrous for the people of Hawaii, uh, writing derogatory editorials that referred to both those of African ancestry and other non-whites as what he called low in mental culture. Um, Miles Jackson has written about this. So in the United States, these attacks took the form of political cartoons published in the likes of widely circulated um, magazines like Judge Magazine and The Wasp, and even in more regional publications like the St. Paul Daily Globe. Um, King Kalakaua and Queen Kapi'olani um, and his sister and successor, Queen Liliuokalani, were drawn as caricatures that relied on over-exaggerated and racist notions of phenotypical racial African diasporic blackness. These expressions of blackness often drew on the piccaninny stereotypes of the American South through exaggerated lips and eyes, hair that was closely cropped or concealed under a headscarf, and the absence of shoes. But these ali'i could also be drawn to read as reminders of tropes of African savagery. Um, caricatures of Lili Ookalani appeared multiple times on the cover of Judge magazine, um, often utilizing stereotypes associated with the Zulu who were resisting British imperialism on the African continent. Um, so Hawaii was framed in the US political and cultural imaginary through images of both domestic familiarity and servitude and foreign threats of violence and rebellion. These disparate but complementary notions of blackness relied on a racialization of Kanaka Mali as black via the African diaspora. To American viewers and readers, um, and remember guys, this is the close of the 19th century, so late 1800s, America is a nation that is only a couple decades removed from the Civil War. And if we're keeping it all the way real, slavery is still practiced under the guise of what, what they called sharecropping, right? Which is slavery in all but name. Um, so to these American viewers and readers, um, this invocation of racial blackness marked Hawaiians as unfit to rule and Hawaii as a nation unfit for sovereignty. Um, so Kalakaua and the Kalani were well aware of the anti-Blackness that pervaded American social and political life. Um, our Ali'i had, since at least the mid-19th century, understood the ways that the unyielding Black-white binary of American racial politics had been mapped onto American imperial desires for Hawaii. Uh, some Ali'i had even written about their refusals to submit to U.S. racialization. Um, they also refused to let the potent, dynamic, and relational qualities of Blackness of Pol be erased. Um, so I've, I've written about this a couple places, but our Ali'i basically, they knew that distancing themselves from racial African diasporic Blackness would have no bearing on American imperial desires. So instead, they proclaimed their connections to the cosmogonic Blackness of Pol through the publication of the Kumulipo. Um, so first, Kalakaua's Hawaiian language version, um, and then with Lili Okalani's English language translation, which comes out in 1897, um, which she works on while under house arrest, from this oligarchy of American usurpers. Um, so these publications were a negation of American imperial expansion, but were first and foremost an assertion of indigenous understandings of the figurative, literal, and political power of Blackness. 
Kalakaua and Lili Okulani's publications asserted that all Kanaka Maoli were connected to the cosmogenic darkness of Po. Um, they asserted that while Americans and Haole in the kingdom attempted to use racial blackness as a marker of their inability to rule, that their connection to cosmogenic darkness is what consecrates them as Ali'i and justifies their rule. They asserted that epistemological, cosmogenic, and ontological blackness were the basis for indigenous sovereignty in Hawaii and indigenous relationality and kinship throughout Oceania. Um, so here I've kind of outlined but a few of the historical fragments of Pole, um, but I'm also curious in our discussion and in the Q&A how we might weave these fragments together to trace a larger discourse around Blackness and its potential now and in the future. Um, so in closing, I have maybe just a few more questions. Um, actually, statements conceal these questions because I'm an academic, guys. <laughs> Uh, but first, the cosmogenic potential of pole offers Kanaka Maoli a way to be in good relation with ourselves and with our Pacific cousins. This cosmogenic connection reminds us to value our connections to other Kanaka and to the islands, waters, and skies which undergird those connections. A revitalized understanding of Blackness as figuratively relational is also fertile ground to have discussions about our relations as Kanaka Maoli uh, to people um, who are literally racially Black, right? Kanaka Maoli kinship is expansive and dynamic, and many mixed race Kanaka, particularly those of European and Asian descent, often find themselves accepted more often than not. With the exception of Black Kanaka, right, like me, whose racial Afro-diasporic Blackness is often marked, especially in Hawaii, as foreign rather than local, leaving many Black Kanaka feeling marginalized in their own homelands and also in the diaspora. Increased understanding of Blackness as relational will also help Kanaka Maoli be in better relation with our many cousins whose Blackness is not Afro-diasporic, but indigenous to Oceania, uh, Fijians, Papuans, Kanaks, um, and many others. What might we rediscover when we place our understanding of cosmogenic Blackness as relational alongside the stories and experiences of our Black Pacific cousins and their experiences of anti-Blackness as a colonial tool? What new trends might emerge in Pacific studies, particularly Pacific literary studies, if we used Blackness as a common language or experience that flows across the colonial cartographies and their attendant linguistic divides of the Anglophone, Francophone, and Hispanophone Pacific. How can Blackness teach us as academics to be in good relation um, with folks in other disciplines? Particularly, how do we understand global articulations of Blackness? Um, so work like Gerald, the work by Gerald Horn, Kido Swan, Natasha Sharma, uh, Joy Enomoto, there are lots of folks doing work on the Pacific, um, yet on, on Blackness in the Pacific, I should say, yet the Pacific is often left out of this um, larger disciplinary field that we call global Black studies, right? Got, all right, I'm abandoning my talk, but like, what does it mean that the Pacific or, or Oceania, right, this huge body of water that takes up so much space on our planet, um, is replete with many fold forms of Blackness, yet it is left out of this discussion of global Black studies, right? Um, what might a Pacific understanding of Blackness um, offer us within the Pacific, outside of the Pacific, um, within what we call Pacific studies, but also in other um, disciplinary discussions? And okay, I realize I asked way more questions and I think I am over time. So I'm going to wrap it up here, but only with the promise that we have this really engaging uh, Q&A. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, mahalo you folks for your time. Thank you, Dr. Warren. And thank you to all of our panelists. That was incredible. I can feel the energy and I'm just so appreciative of all of you. Now I would like to turn the conversation back over to our panelists and invite y'all to be in dialogue with each other. So I'd like to ask what questions do our panelists have for each other? Feel free to jump in if you're eager to go. Uh, 
Um, no question, but just appreciation for everybody's talks. And um, yeah, it's just so nice to hear everyone's work and in conversation with each other. And um, yeah. <laughs> I don't have a question either. I'm just so grateful. Um, I think also the questions that you had, Olivia, I think that those uh, those questions as well could help us uh, to, to really be in conversation with each other. So, so, so grateful to be. Yeah, uh, I saw a number of questions from people that are watching though, and some of them were about the diaspora. And I know that came up in several sort of, uh, in, it was mentioned a few times. And so there's a few people that were wondering sort of, um, yeah, how can we empower, how can we em sort of empower the relationship between those in the, in the islands and the diaspora? How can we break down some of the assumptions around sort of um, authenticity or, or anything like that related to that? And I'd be interested to, to hear uh, people's thoughts on that because um, I mean, for me, one of the, one of the most interesting thing that, that things that came out of the pandemic was that I used to teach Chamorro in coffee shops here on island. So, and I would, uh, for 10 years in coffee shops on the weekend, I would like have a free class. And sometimes there would be two students, sometimes there'd be 20 students. But then because of the pandemic, I couldn't, all the coffee shops were closed. And so at the request of, some of my students, I just started to offer them on Zoom. And then at the request of somebody who said, oh, you know, my, my cousin in the States wants to join your class. And I was like, oh, sure, send them the link. And then, um, and then last year, then what happened was that at one point on one Saturday morning, I had over 200 students in my Zoom tomorrow classes. And so for me, it was very eye-opening uh, to see sort of the energy and men, and some of my students are in this from my Zoom classes that are in the diaspora are, are in the Zoom here right now. Maybe they're Zoom addicts. Maybe that's the issue is they're just addicted to Zoom or something. But um, so I'm definitely interested in that because I think um, going back to what, what was mentioned earlier, you know, trying to, and some of the questions are the questions from the audience also sort of put it to like um, these definitions and these distinctions between us, right? Between Micronesian, Polynesian, Melanesian, diaspora, those in the home islands. Um, how can we break those down in ways that sort of serve our own, our own interests, you know, as opposed to sort of accepting them as ways that disempower us. So I'd, I'd love to hear people's thoughts on that. Great question, Magenta. I was just wondering, Olivia, did you do you want to go with this question? Or because I know that you had a few questions that you wanted us uh, to talk about. I mean, we could, you know, sh whatever, whatever you want. Yeah, I wanted to just ask you all for the questions amongst each other, and then I do have one question that I'll get to right after this. Well, you know, uh, if, if I can, if I could just be, if I could just add something, you know, uh, uh, yeah, first and foremost, you know, your great work, uh, uh, Brother uh, Megetu is, is, we talk about it all the time here in the Bay Area. So uh, you're just, you're such a, a beloved uh, 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 leader. And so it's great, so humbling to be here with you. Um, and your work also to, to Daukiba amongst our many, many communities. You know, your question on what uh, perhaps you might, might unite us and yet recognizes, you know, all our, our differences as well and honors that. I might say, uh, I'm get to, we need to look at uh, the, the thriving decolonization movements that are happening in the Pacific um, right now. Right, I, I, I might say, you know, I was just thinking about that particular image um, from the ceremony that I showed earlier. So that was at the end, but the, at, the, at the height of the ceremony, there were like 300 people there, uh, intergenerational, right? Most of them from the community colleges. Uh, you know, there's so very few Pacific Islander students from UC Berkeley, but every single one of them were there, right? We also had our, our students from uh, uh, Stanford, but the community colleges, and they brought their grandmas and grandpas and aunties and uncles, 
right? To protect the sacred. They were there to stand uh, to protect the sacred. You know, for me as a witness and as a participant, I would say one of the most humbling work that I am a part of is actually the work for Free West Papua, right? This is a work actually that has really united all of us throughout Oceania. It's a work, uh, for those of you who might not know, uh, I just wanted to say the Free West Papua movement uh, is, is actually a, a work to, is actually a work that is a refusal and, a, and to resist white terror, right? It's part of Melanesia or the Black Pacific. And it is a fight against the genocide of a people uh, by the Indo Indonesian government and their militaries to protect um, the, actually the world's largest gold mines are in West Papua. The largest gold mines are in West Papua, the largest uh, 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 reserves of copper ore, and also now because of the green economy, the forests are also uh, are being ex uh, exploited. Um, and uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Anyhow, what I, I guess what I'm trying to say, what you're seeing is this division also, this division that happened, this colonial severing of uh, Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia what we're seeing in these social uh, justice movements, so to speak, or actually more decolonial movements is actually the centering of what the West has deemed as, as marginal, right? The West has told us, especially as Polynesians, that we have no relationship. We don't have a, that we should actually sever our proximity to our black brothers and sisters. What this movement has shown us is that we, as Tongans, right, uh, our late, great uh, uh, Tongan prime minister um, was one of the supporters and he told Tongan people, as Tongan people, he was the founder, one of the founders of the Tongan pro-democracy movement. He said, to, he told our Tongan people, he said, this movement to stand with West Papua is like our movement to fight for our Tongan human rights and democracy, right? He, he hit it right to the core. And so I, I would say, Megatu, if we look at our movements, even the movements for, uh, to protect sacred sites in Guam, right? We, I had the great uh, uh, a blessing to interview uh, Senator uh, Sabina Perez. And you should have seen the people that came to her uh, presentation. This was, you know, Polynesians. I mean, if I have to use these terms, Polynesians, uh, Melanesia, uh, Melanesian, some Fijians, right? It was, the, the, the work for decolonization, the work to protect sacred sites is a work that brings all of us together. And I, I'm gonna be honest guys, I have so many thoughts. I'm not even sure what the original question is, but I'm just excited to be in conversation with some of you. And um, just to, to um, dovetail, um, off of Fui's comments and, and also um, thinking about uh, Miguel's comments on, on language and, and how to reach people. Um, so I, I'm teaching a, I just taught, our semester just ended, woo, uh, a grad seminar on um, Black feminisms and Manuahine and Native feminisms in the Pacific. And so um, I was really fortunate to have students uh, from across the Pacific in this class. And one of the conversations we had is, what are the words that we use for black or blackness in our languages, right? In our indigenous languages, how do those um, register or signify our relationships with other Pacific Islanders or distance them, right? Um, and so obviously there are other Pacific Islanders who have thought about this, right? Uh, Teresa Siangotonu's poem, Mel Uli comes to mind, um, thinking about like, what, what do we say when we say black in our languages? Um, is there a word for blackness? Is there a word for anti-blackness, right? How have some of these words and their meanings shifted over time? Um, so for instance, I had a, a student, um, shout out to you, Leana, right? Um, helping me and teaching us to think about uh, bakuku and what this word means in, in Chamorro, right? Like what are the different instances in which we might use one word for blackness versus another word? Um, and so how do we have these conversations among ourselves, right? But also thinking about how these ideas of race and the severing of relationships have bled into how we even name out, not just ourselves and our bodies, but also the skies and waters around us, right? Um, so 
as a Kanaka Maoli, I might use the word um, the Moana Nui Akea and think that I am being very inclusive of, of all of the Pacific, right? Um, and then I had a, a colleague remind me, well, what about folks who aren't from Polynesia, right? Can you use words like um, uh, Solwara or words that folks in other parts of, of what we call Oceania use, right? And sort of um, just thinking about how our own languages either reinforce or question or sever our ties to each other um, has been really important for me. And it's, uh, it's something that I push others to think through as well. Thank you so much for reflecting on those questions. I'm gonna keep us moving along. I have one question for you all, and then I'm gonna open it up to respond to a lot of the great questions we've received so far throughout all the talks. So reflecting on this moment of celebration of ethnic studies, and Dr. Warren, you were mentioning some graduate students and kind of putting the spotlight on our ethnic studies and Pacific Island student scholars. I wanted to know, um, you know, what advice would you have for new ethnic studies and Pacific Island scholars who want to set off in similar research directions that you all have shared today, or who are interested on in researching themes of indigeneity um, and race across Oceania? Any practical advice that you would give to new students starting out and who are gonna lead our next 30 years? Uh, it's a great question. And I mean, it's hard to do it justice, I think, um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think like the people on this panel can kind of attest to, there are many ways that our people can be scholars and activists. And so I think just one thing sometimes is letting people know that it's okay to take a lot of different kinds of paths to their research. And it, it doesn't necessarily have to be through um, like the Western Academy. Um, but if you do choose to go into the Western Academy, it helps to know as much about it as you can. And so that means you have to find your people that have gone through it and can tell you um, all the drama and all the stuff that you need to know to survive. Um, and that, and once, if you do go into a, a graduate program, um, just to know that you really do need to find um, allies or, you know, people um, who might be among your cohort or might be, you know, from different parts of the university that, um, yeah, that, that you can be in relation to and that you can go to when you need help or you can help them. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I guess that would be part of my advice for people going into graduate school is just, um, yeah, just to know that you'll need a, a support team. <laughs> And the people on this panel um, have, have been mine in, in many different times. I would, um, I would echo Professor Arvin's comments. Um, and, ooh, oh, sorry, Zoom moved around. Okay, you guys are back. Um, one thing I would say is, yeah, definitely don't, I mean, it's, it's good to go into academia. Listen, we need you do these things, be there. But also don't center that type of training as the only way that you can come to this knowledge, right? Um, it took me a long time to be able to say in academic spaces, like, yes, I have a PhD, but really my training in this started when I was eight years old and my mom put me in a halal, right? In a, a hula halal, right? Um, this is where I started learning our chants, our histories, um, and that was, I mean, I had a great time in my PhD program at UCLA, right? But that to me was, was my foundation, doing this from eight up until, you know, in my 20s, which was, you know, I forget it. I'm going to say I still am because we're on camera, right? Um, but like doing those sorts of things, going out to your community and finding that knowledge, but also finding your community on campus and learning how to be your own advocate. Uh, I was lucky enough to have someone in the English department at UCLA 
um, who supported me to do Pacific literature, right? But I had to go outside of my department. I had to go find Professor uh, Keith Camacho working in another department. Um, and he was a great support, still continues to be. Um, there might not be a lot of you on your campus. So all of my, my good PI friends from grad school, none of them were in the English department. Right? They were all in different departments on different campuses um, and just sort of being okay finding that community. Find the people who make your really big campus feel small um, and continue to maintain those relationships. And also like, don't be afraid to reach out. I know for some of us, you know, nobody else in my family had gone and gotten a PhD. I was the first one and I felt like I was surrounded by folks who just came from like, yes, they will be a professor and their parents were professors and their grandparents were professors. And so I always felt a little bit self-conscious asking for help. Um, but I realized that once I reached out to people, they were always willing to help me. Um, so, you know, I'll say this on Zoom, send me an email, right? Um, it, it's on the internet, it's there, you can find me and I will be happy to talk to you. Um, and I think most folks will as well. Um, so just getting, getting over that reservation finding that resource um, and then thinking about ways that you can be that resource for other people. And let's be real, use that institutional money and put it into your community and do programming and events that bring your community onto the campus. Um, whether it's the physical campus when you can do that or through things like Zoom, right? Um, try to do those things as well. Uh, so to respond for that question, um... Yeah, I think it's, I think I always tell young people who have that question about if they should go into grad school or not, I always say, if you have the means to, you should, because um, for many people in the Pacific, you know, uh, you don't get a lot of time to sort of reflect, to research. And so if you have the means and the ability to go on that path, then you should take it. You know, you should definitely take it because it was something that perhaps your parents never thought that they had the ability to do. It's something your grandparents may have thought was beyond them. And this is, and sort of many Pacific Islander societies come from very deliberative societies in which conversation and discussion is an essential component about consensus, about moving ahead, about determining things within a family, within a village and so on. But nowadays, as so many things change, you know, um, you know, uh, many we've lost a lot of that. In Guam, for example, we've lost a lot of that, uh, especially compared to our brothers and sisters in Micronesia, um, who still have a lot more of those traditional spaces for discussion. So I always say, get that because what we used to sort of do in meeting houses, what we used to do on long voyages on the sea. You know, now that energy goes into arguing over sort of whether James Bond should be black or not, or if Hermione Granger is white or not, you know, or talking about if the MCU is better than the DCU and stuff like that. So our, a lot of our discussing, our, the passion for debate and, and engagement, it gets filtered into these other things. But as sort of a grad student, you'll have that ability to really try to get into things. I mean, one thing that I always tell people who, young people who want to go into grad school is, this is a perfect chance where you could just spend a year or two and talk to all of the elders that you could find. Just talk to them, come up with some excuse to talk to every person who's two generations older than you. And then just write it down, record it, because people may not understand the value of that knowledge or that wisdom now, but they will, they'll feel it when it's gone and you will have done something beautiful for a family, for a village or for a community if you were able to ask the questions at a time when perhaps that elder felt like no one cared. No one cared about the knowledge that I carry because the world has changed so much around me. The, the waters are rising, the sky is falling from US military bombs and no one cares what I have to say. But you used that process to do something for your community, for your people, for the Pacific. And so I always say, and to echo what others have said, it's not the beginning and it's not the end of you, but it is a powerful resource, a powerful opportunity that you can use. And um, for many in our community, sort of like for me, I've done hundreds of oral history interviews and I give 
a digital file to the family for those who I interviewed. And sometimes they don't appreciate it until five, 10 years later in which that person passes away and then they never ask them questions. They didn't really know what they felt about these things. And so take advantage of it. I just, I say it's a, it's a great way to sort of serve your community. And if you have that privilege, then definitely use it for that. Definitely. Thank you so much, Mugetu. And I see our time. Uh, you know, I, I just want to follow on that and perhaps just, just, just add a little bit more. You know, in answering this question, relatives, I actually want to uh, recognize and honor our relatives uh, behind bars, right? Our, our incarcerated uh, brothers and sisters. You know, and I, and I borrow a term by one of my mentors, uh, a formerly incarcerated uh, uh, California Indian woman, um, Stormy, Stormy Ogden. And in her, she uses a metaphor that I write about in the dissertation and actually really helped me. It really helped me in, the, in my theorizing. Um, also in this particular way that I answer this question, the question, I really wanna give, I really wanna say, uh, so I wanna send so much love. I want to send so much love and gratitude to the brothers and sisters behind bars, uh, because it was really through my work uh, with our brothers and sisters behind bars uh, at Chowchilla uh, prisons, uh, the, the women, and uh, Solano prisons and San Quentin here in California. It was this work that actually helped me to, to finish the dissertation. And to do what Stormy Ogden, uh, using her metaphor, is to sing my own death songs. Right? And so when I hear any young uh, scholars talk about that they want to, they want to pursue a studies of Pacific Island studies, it's exactly what you're just saying we get to. I say, yes, do it. Do it because like when we talk about uh, an important work, like uh, one of the fathers of Pacific Island studies did at Bailey Hau Ofa, an important work like Oceania, a work of so much compassion, a work of so much compassion, a, a, a work that refuses the erasure of our people, and not just from the past, right? But this is a work that imagines, that dreams the futurities of our people. And it says that there are these, that we can fight. We can fight our colonizers and we can win because we have won, we have won, we are continuing to win. And what Oceania shows us is that we are going to win that with our sacred, our belief in our sacred, our belief in our ancestors and our radical solidarities with other indigenous peoples, with other oppressed peoples, queer, other oppressed peoples. I give a big shout out to our relatives in Palestine right now, in Colombia, and our relatives in West Papua show us that winning is not just possible, it is right here, it is right here. And that is what Oceania is. And singing our own death songs, young scholars, is what we have to do. My work with the prisoners, uh, uh, brothers and sisters, especially with the women prisoners, it was my work with them that actually gave me the courage and the strength to tell the stories that Stormy Ogden says, singing my own death song. To, rape, to write about rape and sexual violence in my Tongan community because I love my Tongan community and because I wanted a different future for young Tongan women, young Tongan gender non-binary peoples and for young Tongan men. So young scholars, I would like to say like your brothers and sisters too, your ancestors too that you don't see who came before you, who did the great work who wrote the important books and books that are not written within academic languages and books that we don't read in academic classrooms. Their prayers, the work of our brothers and sisters behind bars and the work that I did with, with uh, our brothers and sisters who are incarcerated, they prayed for us. They prayed for us. When they read, when I said in a group of Tal North Place with Pacific Islander men intergenerational, all the way to their, from their 80s to their 20s. When they first read at Billy How Offers the Ocean in Us and Our Sea of Islands, relatives, these brothers cried. They cried 
just like all of us, right? They were moved, they were mafana, their, their spirits became alive. Their, sp their spirits were able to leave that confinement that settler colonialism has created for us, that smallness. These men told us in multiple conversations that for the first time, for the first time, they were able to see themselves. So young scholars, please, please do your patonia, follow your ancestral calling. Please tell those stories, those difficult stories. They tell the truth about the violence of settler colonialism. Please tell the stories that tell the violence and the truth that many of us would keep as secrets. And it is important to tell that truth so that we can heal. And it's only when you tell the truth that we can heal. Thank you. Thank you everyone for sharing that wealth of knowledge and experience and advice for our young scholars. I know we all appreciate it here and we'll be able to share this webinar with folks who couldn't be with us today so that advice will live on. I would like us to try to answer two questions before we wrap up. We have about seven minutes left. Um, the first question we received, and this can be for anybody, it wasn't directed at any one panelist. Um, from the audience, the question was, was there any acknowledgement by white settlers of claiming Polynesian lineage descending from whiteness slash Europe whilst also recognizing their darker skin, melanin, or more generally, how do they psychologically reconcile this gigantic disparity? And I'm posting the question in the chat. Whoever would like to answer that question yeah, first, thanks. go for it. I mean, I think it's referencing my work, so I'll, I'll try to answer. Um, yeah, I mean, on, on the one hand, um, you know, when I present this history about uh, white people thinking or claiming that Polynesians were almost white, um, at first that's really hard to grapple with or hard to, it sounds really outlandish at first to some people, or it can be really even um, jarring or disturbing to um, other Pacific Islander people to hear this history maybe for the first time. Um, but I think like we've been talking about in our other, in other response to other questions here, um, to me, it really matters to know these histories because it helps explain the genealogies of how our communities get, get pitted against each other, right? Um, and so, I mean, just on a basic level, um, white settlers who are, who claim that Polynesians are white um, in, you know, 18th, 19th, 20th centuries, um, it, it didn't really, to me, it didn't really necessarily matter what Polynesians look like because Polynesians then and today have a range of skin color, right? And so one thing ethnic studies teaches us, right, is that race is not only about skin color. It's about a much kind of deeper knowledge production about people that white people think are other from them. Um, so that's kind of one answer, but um, another answer is just um, that this is a white fantasy of what Polynesians are, right? And it didn't matter what they look like because it was a white settler fantasy. And so um, I think some of the more familiar images that people might be familiar with are um, that come from this genealogy are like images of the hula girl, right? Like the, that are, come out of the tourist industry, but it also comes out of this longer history of uh, white people, um, you know, romanticizing Polynesian women in particular ways and sexualizing them in particular ways. Um, and, and, the way, and so if you think about it, the hula girl images are sometimes it's called like the dusky maiden. So they're like a little bit um, dark and, to an extent that they're kind of exotic, right? But they're always generally pretty light-skinned, right? And so what I'm saying with my research is those, those kind of images, um, 
that are kind of whitened images of, of Pacific Islanders or Polynesians. It comes out of this longer history of, of social scientific writing about, about Pacific Islanders um, from a white settler perspective. Um, and I mean, another reference point is like the idea of a noble savage, right? Which um, has been applied to Native Americans. And so it, it was a different but similar kind of idea that was applied in the Pacific. Awesome, thank you. Now let's try to get to one last question. Our time is almost up. This has been such a great conversation. I wish we could have a four hour panel because um, we have a lot of questions. So the last question, um, they would like to ask the panelists about their knowledge of Pacific Islander health and how that's been affected by race and indigeneity, colonialism and militarism. Spam. <laughs> spam. Just, just take a can of spam and just kind of reflect on it. You can use recreational drugs if you want to, to aid in your reflection, but just reflect on the can of spam, how it came into the islands, but also how many islanders really love spam or feel pride in spam. And so, and have found ways to adapt it and so on. But the can of spam tied, is tied to militarization, the impact of the military on our islands, and how our culture becomes, in many cases, very intimately connected to that. Our sense of identity for many people become very intimately connected to that. It also connects to our poor health. That islanders nowadays, because of how our diet has changed so dramatically, and a lot of it just starts with that can of spam, right? But that idea that sort of for Chamorros, it was very strong that, in, that working the land was what primitive people did. Modern people buy their food in cans. If you want to show you're modern, you want to show you're American, get it off a shelf and pay a dollar for it. And that's how you can sort of consume the whiteness, even, even though the meat's kind of pink and gross sometimes. But uh, and so. I think that you, if to understand that sort of the spam is a great place to start. <laughs> yeah, I I am now I'm now meditating on spam, and so my initial response is I've like let it go. Um, but to that, I would add, yeah, like thinking about how these these foods that are possibly unhealthy um, and were foreign have now become staples of our diet, right? Like. I'm not going to pretend I've never had spam musubi or, or pea soup bowl, right? Or um, corned beef hash. Um, but I, this, I, I appreciate this question because one of the things I think folks forget, and I'm speaking as someone, right, who's Hawaiian, um, but this applies to many folks in the Pacific um, where land is like finite, right? Um, and so when you have uh, military bases, right, militarization, um, we can understand it in many ways, but one of the ways we really need to understand it as is as this force of land consumption, right? And so I had someone tell me once, um, you know, a Hawaiian activist who worked out in the Lo'i, right, in the, the taro fields, and they said that real sovereignty is food sovereignty, right? And so what happens when you have an economy that is now dependent on imports? Um, what happens when you cannot get those things? And so thinking about the many ways that um, food and our health and our land and militarization are all really wrapped up um, is something I, I don't think we think about enough, right? So what would it mean not just to like not go buy that spam, but to be able to have access to the land um, that used to be able to be accessed by all and, and sustain us all, right? Um, so it's, it's thinking about how do we reconnect with those practices and recultivate them um not just in an effort like to be in better relation but also for our health um but having said that i am totally going to think about spam for like the 20 minutes after this zoom call reflect on the spam but maybe not eat it maybe not eat it but reflect on it 
No, no, not, no, no eating it, but just thinking of it. I, I will consume it intellectually in my thoughts. Thank you, everybody. And with that, we are sadly out of time. Um, thank you so much for joining us and just sharing all about your work and advice for us to continue building on the amazing work you all have started for us. Um, I do wanna share that the, there's a lot of questions we didn't get to uh, respond to. They are all saved. So if any of the panelists wanna stay on and respond to any uh, through the chat, that's an option as well. Uh, the recording of this panel will be available on the Ethnic Studies Department website um, and their YouTube channel. And I think they did share a link with that in the chat. So be on the lookout for that. And just a warm, warm thank you, so much gratitude. And I hope that we can all be in conversation again very soon and hopefully in person. Thank you everybody for joining us today.